as we wait for more people to join, as we wait for more people to join, try this review problem. Okay, so I think most I think most people have joined by now. So I'm going to go straight to the solution to this problem. So this is a problem from the 2011 AMC 8. How many four-digit positive integers have four different digits where the leading digit is not zero? The integer is a multiple of five, and five is the largest digit. Okay, so let's draw our slots so we can see what's going on here. We have four digits. So we have four digits right here. And we're given that it's a multiple of five. So if it's a multiple of five, that means this last digit right here, this digit here has to either be five or zero. So we see it has to be five or zero. So we look at two cases. So let's draw another, let's draw four more slots here for the second case. So let's say that um, the five is the one that we have here, and over here we have a zero. So if this is a five, we are given that five is the largest digit. So let's just look at the first digit. Let's look at the choices for the first digit. So the first digit can typically be anything zero, one, two, three, four, five, and dot, dot, dot. But anything larger than five won't work because the problem states that five is the largest digit of our number. So all of these cases won't actually work. So we can only have zero, one, two, three, four, or five. And in addition, we have that all, our, all the digits of our number are different. So, all, so the digits are different. So we can't have five as well, because if we have five, then we have two fives in our number, and that's not allowed based on our problem statement. So therefore, we can only have, in addition, zero doesn't work because it's a leading digit. So we only have four choices for this digit right here. Now what about for this next digit? Just like earlier, this next digit can be anything 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. But let's say we arbitrarily chose 2 to be our digit here. Then we can't have 2, and we only have 4 choices left for this digit. And then same thing for this, for this digit. And let's just say we arbitrarily chose 3 to be this digit right here. And we have 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And 2 and 3 both don't work. So we're left with 3 choices. And of course, this only has 1 choice because we're saying that it's a 5. And this, if you find the product of this, 4 times 4 is 16, and 16 times 3 is 48. So there are 48 ways in this case right here. Now the other case, the other case is when we have 0 in this digit right here. So now, if 0 is in this digit right here, we still have that 5 is the largest digit. So that means 5 has to either go here, here, or here. Five has to go in one of these slots because we're given that five is the largest digit. So there, we're going to multiply this at the end, but there are three choices from which where the five can go. So let's just say the five went here, for example. So if the five is here, then now we've taken care of the case that's the largest digit. Let's look at the remaining choices for the other digits here, these two digits here. So for this digit, we could originally we could originally have one. We could originally have one, two three or four and anything greater than five doesn't work because we already have our five here and it's a large digit. So one, two, three, or four. Let me actually move this down here because this is where we've chosen five to be the digit here. And one, two, three, or four. So there are four choices. There are four choices for the which digit to go in this slot right here. And since we've designated five to be the one in this slot, there's just going to be one choice for this, of course. And now we've already used Let's just say we have the number two that we chose. We let's just say we chose two to be the one for that digit. Then for this digit right here, this one right here, for this digit, we could again we could have zero, one, two, three, or four. But zero doesn't work because it's here. So zero, we can cross that out right away. And now this can either be one, two, three, or four. But then it can't be two because we've already used it. So then we have three choices here. 
And since we've assigned this to be this digit to be zero, there's only going to be one choice for this digit right here. So our product is just going to be three times four to twelve, hence three, which is thirty-six. Now we add these up. Forty-eight plus thirty-six is eighty-four. So final answer is eighty-four for this review problem. Any questions? Okay, so let's move on to homework review. So we're going to go over some homework problems from last week. How many three-digit numbers contain the digit five at least once? So let's look for this key wording that we always see, at least. At least once. So this typically means we have to use complementary counting. So how many three-digit numbers are there? So you can think of the three-digit numbers as being these three slots. The first digit can be anything from 1 to 9, the second digit from 0 to 9. And remember, right now I'm just finding the total number of three digit numbers. And this last digit can also be 0 to 9. So there are 9 choices times 10 choices times 10 choices, which is a total of 900 three digit numbers. So there are 900 total three digit numbers. But now, since we're using complementary counting, what's the opposite of containing digit 5 at least once? Well, that's not containing the digit 5 at all. So let's look at these three slots once again. So we have these three slots. And this could typically be anything from 1 to 9. But now we can't have a 5 because we're doing the opposite. So there's only going to be 8 choices. Now for this digit right here, it could typically be 0 to 9. But again, it can't be a 5. So there are 9 choices. And again, this can be anything 0 to 9 usually. But then it can't be a 5. So we again multiply by 9. And we have the 8 times 9 is 72, and 72 times 9 is 648. So since we're using complementary counting, we subtract, and we get our final answer to be 252. Okay, so now I'll move on to problem 2. I think almost everybody got this problem right, so I'm going to be going over it pretty quickly. So Paul owns Paula 35 cents and has a pocket full of 5 cent coins 10 cent coins and 25 cent coins that he can use to pay her. What's the difference between the largest oops, difference between the largest and smallest number of coins he can use to pay her? Let's first take a look at the largest number of coins. Since the smallest currency is five cent coins, the small the largest number of coins will be when we use the smallest cent value. This will just be when we use all five cent coins. And this can be done when we have seven. This can be done when we have seven nickels. This gives us 35 cents. In this case, we have seven coins. But now we find the smallest number of coins we can use. So we try to use the biggest currency. So first we use a quarter, 25 cents. But then there's 10 cents left. So how, how can we do this? With a 10 cent coin. And then this gives us again 35 cents. And this uses two coins. So what's the difference between them? It's just seven minus two, which is equal to five. This is our final answer for this problem. Okay, so let's move on to number three. How many three even numbers are there with distinct digits? So before we go into how do we actually solve this problem, let's see what we can try doing here. So we have these three, 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 three slots that are three digits. So just like this can be anything, we deal with the most restrictive conditions first, if you remember that in the first class. So this can be 0, 2, 4, 6, or 8. So it's the most restrictive, so we start off with this. So let's just say we chose 2, for example, right? Then this digit, it could typically be anything from 1 to 9, but then we can have a 2. So there are actually 8 choices. But then we see, what if this digit is instead is 0? Well, well, if this digit is, let's say, 0 then, well, this, this still has nine choices because you can still have one to nine because zero is anyways not included in the total here. Therefore, we cannot use the direct counting. So we divide it into two cases. One with this digit right, this digit right here. Oops. One where this digit right here is zero and one where it's two, four, six, or eight. So let's, let's write out our two cases. So let's draw three more slots for our second case. So now in this case, let's just say that we chose zero. The zeros are digit here. 
In this case, we can have anything from one to nine, so nine choices. And then for this digit, you could typically have zero to nine, but now we can't have this. So that doesn't work. So there's actually going to be eight choices here. And this, sorry, this should actually not be zero here. This should be a zero over here. This has to be a zero in this case. So there's going to be one choice for this. So this is a total of 72. Oops. 72 for this case. Because nine times eight is 72. And now this other case, we have two, four, six, or eight. So we have four choices here. But then let's just say we arbitrarily chose four, for example, maybe. Four, was there anything that we chose here? So this is four right here, then this over here, so this is four. And this could typically be one to nine. Excluding the four, there's eight choices. And this could typically be zero, zero to nine. And then let's just arbitrarily say this is a three we chose. And now it could typically, since this could typically be zero to nine, it can't be three or four. And then there's actually only seven choices for this case right here. Multiply this out, we get 224. Okay, so, and then our total right here, it would be, um, if we add this up, this would actually be a value of um, 200 and, wait, no, it's something, yeah, this is actually not right. Um, let me go back and change it. So this could typically be one so to nine, excluding four. And this could typically be zero to nine, except it can't be four. Or so this would actually be, um, this would, like this would actually be eight, sorry. This would be eight, because it could be zero to nine. Sorry about that. This would actually be a value of 330. This would be 256. This sums to a value of 328. Sorry, okay, so now let's move on to number four. How many ways are there to select a group of three people from five women and three men if there must be at least one man in the group? Okay, so let's use complementary counting again. And this, you know what, because you want to use complementary counting, you see this at least over here. At least means complementary counting, is probably what we want to use. So what's the opposite of having at least one in the group? Having no men at all. So how many ways are there to have only women in the group or no men at all? This is just going to be five, choose three. And this is because we choose three people from the five women in order to have zero men in the group. And this is equal to five factorial over three factorial times five minus two, which three, five minus three, which is two factorial. If you evaluate this, it comes out to be 10. And now we must have practiced from the total number of ways of selecting three people from eight people. How many ways can we do this? Well, we have eight, two, three which is equal to, and again, eight factorial over three factorial, eight minus three is five factorial, and if you evaluate this, it comes out to be 56. So there are 56 ways to choose three people from a group of eight people. So this is the total number of ways right here, and this is the number of ways so there are no men in the group. If you subtract them all, we get 56 minus 10 equal to 46 is our answer for this problem. Okay, so now let's move on to number five. At Euler Middle School, 198 students voted on two issues in the school re referendum with the following results. 149 voted in favor of the first issue. 119 voted in favor of the second issue. If there were exactly 29, if there were exactly 29 students who voted against both issues, how many voted in favor of both issues? Let's draw a Venn diagram really quickly. We actually let's leave the Venn diagram for now because we're running short on time. So we have a total of 198 students. We have a total of 198 students. And out of these 198 students, 149 voted in favor of the first issue and 119 voted in favor of the second issue. But then we have to find, let's first find the number of students who voted in favor of one of the issues at least. So there, this is number, these are the number of people who voted for the first issue and 119 for the second. So we subtract the number of people who voted for both to find people who voted for either one of them. So how many people voted for both? Well, that's an unknown, so let's just call it X for now. But then we also have to add that, we also have to add the number of students who voted against both issues. And how many students voted against both issues? We're given that it's 29. So we add 29 right here. And if you, and after that, you can very easily solve this problem and you get that we get x is equal to 99. 
that therefore 99 students voted in favor of both issues. So 99 is the final answer. Let's move on to the next problem. How many positive numbers less than or equal to 200 are multiples of two and three, but not a multiple of five? So a multiple, being a multiple of two and three is the same as being a multiple of six. So how many multiples of six are there? This is just going to be 200 divided by six, which is equal to 33. Well, how many multiples of five are there? Well, how many multiples of five have you overcounted? Well, in order for that to be true, it has to be multiple of both five and six or a multiple of 30. And how many ways are there to do that? How many numbers are there? 200 divided by 30. Which, and again, we're just ignoring the remainders because they don't matter. This is six. And we subtract and we get 27 as our answer. Okay. Any questions on the homework before I move on? So just to review, these are the problems that we went over. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna move on to probability today. So today we're gonna to learn about probability. Probability is the likelihood of something happening. To calculate probability, you need to know how many possible options or outcomes are there, and how many right combinations are there. So as many of you probably know, probability is just the total successful outcome divided by the number of possible outcomes. So in order to illustrate this concept, I'll take a simple example. Two dice are rolled. What is the probability some of the numbers rule is two. Okay, so what are the possibilities? What are possibilities can lead to something two? Both the dice have to be one. That's the only way for this to be possible. Because let's say we had other dice. If any of the numbers is greater than one, then the sum would be larger than two. So that's not allowed. Therefore, there's only one way. There's only one way for the sum of the numbers rules on two dice to be two. So now we found this total successful outcome to be one. So now we must find the total possible outcome. Well, how many ways are there to roll two dice? Like what are the number of possible outcomes of two dice being rolled? So we have these two, two, two dice that are being rolled here. This can be anything from one to six on our first roll and one to six. So six choices times six choices for each of the dice. This is 36. So the probability is just, this is 36 right here. So the probability will just be equal to one over 36. This is our answer. Okay, let's try a very similar. So before I move on, any questions on this problem? So I'm just going to highlight the key things here. We found the total successful outcome, then the total possible outcome, and then we just divide it. And that's the same procedure used for most probability problems. But then as we see later, there's also some other things you can do. Okay, let's move on then. Two dice are rolled. What is the probability the sum of the numbers is not instead of one for this time? Okay, so in this case, let's do the same approach as we did here. So how, let's take a look. What if the first die rule is one? Then what will be the second die? Well, it has to be three since one plus three is four. And what if the first die rule is a two? Then the second die, in order for the sum to be four, has to also be two. But then what if the first die rolls is three? And the second die has to be one. And for example, let's say the first die rolls is four or more, four plus, then the sum will already be four. So and since the second die has to be at least one, this is not possible. So we only have three possibilities here. And just from here, early from earlier here, we found that there are 36 possible outcomes from a die. We have our answer is three over 36, which is one twelfth. So keep in mind your probability problems should leave your answer in a fully simplified common fraction. Don't convert it to a decimal or percent or anything unless the problem is explicitly says to. So like in general, just leave it Simplified fraction. 
Okay, so any questions on this problem? Okay, let's move on. So a box contains five cards, numbered one, two, three, four, and five. Three cards are randomly selected without replacement. Okay, so you might be wondering, what does without replacement even mean? So basically, without replacement means if I like, if you have a box and I take something out, and then when I'm drawing again, I don't draw the same item. So like, when I take out an item from the box, for example, I put it aside when I draw again. Similarly, with replacement, that would essentially mean I take something out of the box or take something out of something, and then I put it back in the box when I draw again. And this will change the probability. So when you're doing problems, make sure to be on the lookout for without replacement and with replacement, as they really distinguish the problem and what we're trying to find. So in this case, we have without route, without replacement. So all cards drawn will have to be different. We can't draw one and then draw one again. That's not allowed because we put the one to the side already. So what's the probability? What's the probability right here? That the four is the largest value selected. Okay, so we have the five cards, one, two, three, four, and five. So if four is the largest value, of course we have to choose four. So of course we must have four in order for it to be the largest value. And since it's the largest value, we can't have anything larger than four either. Because if you had a five, for example, then four would no longer be the largest value. It would be five. So we can't have five. But then we have, we have to draw three total cards. And we've already drawn one card here. So we must draw two more cards. So we, therefore we have to draw two more cards. So out of these remaining three cards, we must to take two of them. So how many ways can we do this? We must choose two of the cards out of these three cards. So three, choose two. And this is three factorial. This is three factorial over two factorial times three minus two, which is one factorial. And if you evaluate this, you get the three. So there are three ways of choosing out of these remaining three cards to choose two of them to be chosen. And of course, we can have the same card over again. But now, probability. So what is the total number of possible ways to choose these three cards from these five cards? So how many ways are there to choose these three cards from the five cards? Five choose three. And what's five choose three? Five factorial over three factorial times five minus three, which is two factorial. And this is evaluate. If you evaluate it, you get 10. So the probability will just be Three over ten. Any questions? So I have a question. How do you get three ways? Why not four? Oh, so three ways. This is because that we have these three cards and we have to choose two of them. We have to choose two of them because we already choose we already chose another we already have four as one of our chosen cards. So we have three cards left and we must choose two more of them. In order to be to in order to for us to choose. Does that answer your question? Because three choose two, we have two cards left after already choosing the four. Okay. So now let's move on to this problem right here. From the 2016 AMC8. A top hat contains three red chips and two green chips. Chips are drawn randomly, one at a time. Okay, again, you see these keywords that you want to remember probably without replacement. So we're without replacement. So again, that means we cannot draw the same thing over and over. We can't draw the same exact chip over because we already put it aside until all three of the reds are drawn or until both green chips are drawn. So it's a probability that the reds are drawn first. Okay, so let's see why. Let's just take an example case, for example. Let's say we drew a green. Uh, let's say we drew a green card, then a then a um, then a red card, then another red card, then a green card. In this case, we drew the two greens first because we drew the two greens before the three red cards. Okay, so let's just say, for example, we continue drawing, 
Let's just say we continue drawing until let's say we continue drawing until we finished all the chips until we drew all the chips. So then we would have red here. Okay, so we have we drew the three reds. So already we know that green is going to be the one chosen first because we know we already have both the greens chosen. But then the three reds, the three reds, we see that red is the last one. Red is the last chip that we have here. So let's try a similar scenario. What if we have, for example, red, red, and then we have red again, let's say, for example. In this case, red is the one being drawn first. So red is the one that's going to be the one drawn first. So let's just say again, just like earlier, let's finish it. Let's, let's see what happens when we draw all the chips in the hat. Of course, both of these will have to be green. And this is because these are the only chips that we have left. So you might notice. When green is the one that is drawn first, when both the green are drawn first, red is the last chip that's there. When both the reds are drawn first, green is the last chip that's there. So, and you might think, be thinking that, that maybe for all case, all drawings, the last chip that's drawn is gonna be the opposite of the chip drawn first. And this is exactly true. This is because, the, let's say, for whatever chip color we drew last, the other chips must have been drawn before. So that means all the other colored chips. So if you have green last, the three red must be before. If you had red last, two greens must be before. So we can see, so our, the problem is asking for the probability that the three reds are drawn first. So what's the probability the three reds are drawn first? Well, the probability the three reds are drawn will just be the probability the green is last. Because if the three reds are drawn first, then the greens must have come after it because we drew the reds first. So now this, is, this becomes a really simple problem. Essentially, we're just looking at the probability that green is the last chip. And what's the probability of this? The probability the green is the last chip here? Well, we have five total chips, of course, and two of them are green. So again, this is just our probability, two fifths. And this may seem like a tricky idea. We changed this complicated problem into such a simple problem. So let's explain, let me, let me explain it a little bit more. Basically, these two greens here, we if we drew them first, then the three reds, and the three reds have to be the ones, that, one of the reds has to be the ones drawn last. Since we can't have the three reds, the, red, the greens drawn first and for it to be last. Because if it's last, that means the other color must have been drawn first. So, okay, so hopefully that clar clarified some things. This is a very tricky idea, but it made a complicated problem extremely simple. Okay, so any questions on this problem? Okay, then I'm going to move on to this next problem over here. This again relies, we're not gonna actually use total successful outcomes over total possible outcomes. We're gonna use this slightly unique idea, just like last time. Two cards are dealt from a deck of four red cards labeled A, B, C, and D, and four green cards, labeled A, B, C, and D as well. A winning pair is two of the same color or two of the same letter. What's the probability of drawing a winning pair? Okay, so let's just draw, write all, the, write all of our things out. These are the green cards, and these are the red cards. So let's just say we arbitrarily chose something to be our first card drawn. So let's just say a first card we drew was a C, a green C. So now what other cards can form a winning pair? So winning pairs to the same color or to the same letter. Okay, so what are the possibilities? What cards will result in two of the same letter being drawn? Well, if you choose the green C and the red C, then we have a pair. In addition, we also have two of the same color, a pair. So if we choose a green C or and a green B or a green A or a green D, these also work. So as you can see, for the C, there are four possibilities that work. So there are four possibilities and there's seven remaining cards because four times two minus one, the C, because it's these seven cards right here. And they're the ones that can be drawn after that. So the probability for the, if you choose the green C first, the probability of having a winning pair is 4-7. But this is only for the green C. 
But if you notice that if you choose any other card, let's say for example, the red B, it doesn't matter. It's always gonna have three other cards the same color as it and one other card, the same letter as it. So no matter what, there's always gonna be three plus one equal to four ways to choose a second card, such that it's a winning pair. So no matter, it doesn't really matter which card you choose, it can be any one of these cards right here. You can choose any one of these cards and out of any of these cards, you can choose any of them as a first card and always four of the remaining seven possibilities will work. So this is our final answer. Any questions? Nope. Okay. Okay, so now let's move on to some geometric counting problems. So basically, we're gonna we be counting geometric objects and seeing how many geometric figures are there in this, in this problem right here. So how many triangles can be formed by connecting three points? Okay, so one way you can just list it out. I mean, you could do this, you could count the number of ways of each of the different triangles, you could have this. But, okay, as you can see, it's already going, you're gonna pop, it's really easy to make a mistake on because there's so many of them. In addition, it's, it's also gonna be, it's a really easy to screw up on and it's gonna take a lot of time. So any, is there anything you can do to simplify this problem? In fact, there is. So let's, we have these nine points, right? And connecting three points, so essentially out of these nine points, out of these nine points, we have to choose three of them essentially. So out of these nine points that are there, we must choose three of them in order to form a triangle. So any three points that we choose, for example, like this, or this, or this, for example, maybe. So as you can see, any three points we choose as the vertices, we can get a triangle except for this combination right here. So as you can see, most, most combinations of three points actually result in a triangle being formed, but not all of them. And to see this, consider these three points right here. They, they all lie in a line. We chose three points, but they don't form a triangle because they all lie in a line. So we have to subtract, this is just like we have to use complementary counting, subtract the number of cases in which these three points don't form a triangle. So basically, essentially what we have to do is count the number of lines in this figure right here. Just count the number of lines in this figure. Because a line is not a triangle, even though it consists of three points. So how many lines of three points are in this figure? Well, we can, we can also label these points right here. We can have these three red ones that I just marked. Or we can have these three blue ones like that. Or we could also have two diagonal ones like this. We have to subtract eight essentially. Subtract eight points. So if you want to evaluate nine two three, this is just going to be nine factorial over three factorial times nine minus three factorial, which is six factorial. And if you want to evaluate this, this actually results in being nine two three results in being eighty four. And eighty four minus eight, this is just going to be seventy six. So there are 76 possible triangles in this figure. So again, just to highlight the idea, we chose three points, but not all of them work. Most of them work, but not all of them. So the ones that didn't work were the ones that are in a line. So we subtracted all combinations of three points that resulted in a line. And there were these three, three red lines, three blue lines, and two green lines. So we subtracted them all from nine to three, and we got 76. Okay, so are there any questions on this problem? Okay, so I think it's time. I think we can move on to this next geometric counting problem right here. So how many squares of all sizes can be formed from the three by three grid squares? So you might be immediately thinking that at the back of your head, oh, of course it's just nine, because there's nine squares. But the key word in this problem is all sizes, all sizes. So for example, this would also be another square possibility, like this square right here. This is another square, and it's not just it's one by one square, it's a two by two square. So therefore we might see, oh, maybe there are other squares other than these, just these one by one squares. So of course, let's take three cases. There's, there can be one by one squares, two by two squares, 
or three by three squares. So of course, one by one squares, there's just gonna be nine of them. Three by two squares, well, there's only one of them, of course. And now two by two squares, this is a slightly tricky one. So let's, let me just mark them all. You can also have this square right here. There's another possibility, square square. Or you could have this right here. This square. Or you can have this square. So as you can see, there are four squares in this case. So there are four possible, four two by two squares in our grid here. So since the problem is asking for how many squares of all sizes, we just add these up. So it's nine plus four plus one, this is just equal to 14. And then you might also notice this is three squares. This is two squares, and this is one square. And, this, and you might see a pattern, maybe, maybe it's true for higher grids. And in fact, it is true. And as you can see, we have a general formula for this right here. So the general formula for the number of squares and the size square grid and dimensions is one squared plus two squared plus three squared plus four squared all the way till n squared, where n, n by n is the dimension of the grid. So like in five by five, it would be one squared plus two squared plus three squared plus four squared plus five squared. And the three by three grid that we just did, just one squared plus two squared plus three squared. Okay, so with this in mind, do you have any questions on the formula or this problem that we just went over? Okay, so now we can move on to the next this thing right here. Okay, so something's not really working here. Okay, so as you can see, it's kind of cut off for now, but the problem is just asking how many rectangles of all, any size are in the figure below. So this might be extremely hard to just count them all out because it would be a really long case, a lot of cases. Oh, it's working now. Okay, so how many rectangles of all size, any size? So it would be really, really hard to count out. So can we think of a simpler way? And it's illustrated in this diagram right here. Sorry, there's some, something weird going on here. So yeah, so basically, as you can see in that diagram that you just saw, you can basically consider drawing any two lines. You can draw like this line right here, this line right here, this line right here, and this line right here. And as you can see, they form a rectangle. So as you can see, we chose two vertical lines and two horizontal lines, and they form the rectangle. And this is true for other cases too. Like we could have these green lines here we have these green lines here, and then we could have maybe a red line here and a purple line here. So as you can see, these red, purple, and green lines, they form another rectangle right here in the middle. This rectangle is formed by two vertical lines and two horizontal lines. And similarly, we, we have the bigger rectangle as well. So as you might see, that we can choose any two vertical lines and any two horizontal lines, and they'll form a rectangle. So now we just have to figure out how many vertical lines and how many horizontal lines are there. And we have that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have seven vertical lines. And we have, let's count the number of horizontal lines. One, two, three, four, five. So we have five horizontal lines and, and seven vertical lines. So then all we really have to do is find the number of vertical lines, the way to choose two vertical lines, and the number of ways to choose two horizontal lines. And this is just seven choose two times five choose two. And again, you can evaluate this, seven choose two, which will just be, um, you can evaluate it yourself and it should just be 21. And five choose two should just be 10. So we have the seven choose two times five choose two is 210. So 210, the, the answer to this problem is 210. 
We had 210 rectangles. Imagine trying to count them all out by hand. First of all, that'll take you a very, very long time, and you might miss a lot of cases. So purely this method is much better. So just like this, for any rectangle, you can have, have a general formula too. So the general formula for the number of rectangles of all sizes in a rectangular grid of n by n is just n plus one choose two. So basically, that's the number of vertical lines, and n plus one choose two. That's the number of horizontal lines, essentially. Okay, so any questions on the formula or the number of ways to count rectangles in the grid? Okay, so I'll move on to, let's move on to the let's come next one here. So a mouse is standing on a grid. A mouse is standing on a grid at a location zero zero. There's cheese on the grid at five five. It can only move right or up. Okay, so how many different paths can you take? to get the cheese, which is here. Okay, so one possible path, which is mark it, for example, you could take like this, for example. There, and there, so that's one possible path. And maybe another possible path could be So these are two possible paths I drew here. But counting all of them, again, that would be very hard. So let's try using the flicker method, just like last time. So essentially, we have to move from zero to zero to five, five. We have to take five right steps and five up steps. So essentially, we have to, we have to, we have, somehow we have to get from here to here, we must take these steps. So let's just see what steps, what sequential pattern we take to so move here. So the root case okay, so here, we take an up step, an up step, a right step, an up step, an up step, a right step, a right step, a right step, and then an up step, and then a right step. So basically, this is up, up, right, up, up, right, 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 and then up, right. So we can see that this, this right here is just a permutation of this word, R, 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 five R's and five U's. So, and for the red top, we can do something very similar, and we would find a very similar, we would find another rearrangement of this word right here. So then we, we wonder, what, how many ways are there to do this? Well, it would just be the number of ways to rearrange the letters in this word. And this is because that any permutation of this word, any, any or ordering of this word, you could just move that, you can, for R, you could just move up, and for U, for R, sorry, for R, you can move right, and for U, you can just move up. And therefore, you'll always get to the cheese by taking a path like this. So how many ways are there to do this? Well, this year, again, you can just use a word ordering formula if you remember that from class one. So this is just going to be 10 factorial because there are 10 letters divided by five factorial since there are five R's and five factorial since there are five U's. And this, if you evaluate, is 252. So this seems very interesting. We could just we form the complicated path problem do such a simple rearrangement of just a word. Okay, so any questions on this problem before I move on to the general formula? Okay, so let's move on then. General formula for the number of ways to go from zero, zero to x, y. It's just x plus y, choose x. So essentially what this means is that if you have like x, you want to take three steps up and four steps right, we're just going to be three plus four to three, because that's the number of ways to rearrange the word. Okay, so I think we can move on to this problem right here, which is just an application of what we just learned. So Samantha lives two blocks west and one block south of the southwest corner of City Park. Her school is two blocks east and two blocks north of the northeastern corner of City Park. On school day, she bikes on street to the southwest corner of City Park. And then she takes a diagonal path through the park to the northeast corner, and then she bikes on streets to school. How many different routes can she take? 
if a root is as short as possible. Okay, so we're given that the root is as short as possible. And it says that travels only on these things. So we're given immediately that the number of ways to go from here to here, this right here, is obviously one. So in order to find the number of ways to go from this point to this point, let's just find the number of ways to go from here to here, here to here, and here to here. And then we can multiply them all together. Okay, so how many ways are there to go from here to here? And again, the problem we're given, that she bikes on streets in the southwest corner, and her route is as short as possible. So she's not gonna go like, she's not gonna go like here, and then she's not gonna take a like, go like that. So that's not the shortest possible route. So she has to go, she has to take as few steps as possible. And that's three from here to here. So she has to move two right and one up step. So we're trying to make the path as short as possible. So we cannot have any more than three steps because that's the minimum, because we have to move from minimum from here to here is just three steps. Okay, so how many ways do we go from here to here? Well, we have to go two right. We have to go two right, two, two steps right, and one step up. So by the formula, this is just going to be, since we have to go from zero, zero to two, one, it's just going to be two plus one, two, one, which is three, two, one. And if you evaluate that, it's just three. So there are three ways to go from this to this. Okay, so now let's find the number of ways to go from here to here, as we already found, it's just one. This is an obvious case. Now, just like earlier, let's find the number of ways to go from here to here. Okay, so how, how many ways do you go from here to here? Well, there's two steps right and two steps up. So this will just be four. It would be four or two plus two. Two, two, which is four, two, two. And if you evaluate that, it's just six. So there are three ways to get from here to here. One way to get from here to here and six ways to get from here to here. So we multiply these all together. Three times one times six. And this gives us 18. Okay, so now we're gonna do some practice problems. To try on your own. How many four digit numbers are not palindromes? I'm going to give you around a minute or two to try solve this on your own. Try to see if you can solve this problem on your own. I'm going to give a quick hint here. A palindrome is basically a number that reads the same forward and backward. So I just want to explain what a palindrome is. So a palindrome 1 through 21 is a palindrome because if you read it forward, it's 121. And if you read it backward, it's also 121. But then, for example, 136, this is not a palindrome because 136, if you read it forward, and 631, if you read it backward. This is not a valid palindrome. So here's a hint to get you started on this problem. A number a palindrome has to be of the form A, B, and A, where A or where A and B are digits or single digits. For, for the four-digit case, it should actually be A, B, B, A. So A, B, B, A. So let's see if we can try to find the number of ways of choosing number four-digit palindromes from here. See if we can try to do it. So here's a hint. I'll give you some slots. Yeah, one, two, three, four. Okay, so we have four slots. So again, these two digits. Have to be the same. And these two digits also have to be the same. So as a hint, again, this can be one to nine. This can be zero to nine. And this has to be the same as this. And, and over here, this has to be the same as that. Okay, so try to find the number of ways, try to find the number of choices for this digit right here. 
then the number of choices for this is right here. And then also try to, and then from here to here, well, this should just be the same as these digits. Because this has to be the same digit as that. So this third digit has to be the same digit as the second digit. The fourth slot has to be the same as the first slot. Okay, so this is a reminder. This digit has to be the same. So for, this is three. This has to be three as well. If this is four, this has to be four. Okay, so let's first find the number of palindromes. And then we'll subtract it off in order to find the numbers that are not palindromes at the end. So let's we'll worry about that later. So first, how many four digit palindromes are there? There are nine choices for the first digit and 10 choices for this digit. Okay, so for the third digit right here, the third digit, the third digit has to be the same as the second digit. So there's just gonna be one choice. And the fourth digit, in order for it to be a palindrome, it has to be the same as the first digit. So there's again one choice here. So this is 90. Because there are nine choices for the first digit and 10 choices for the second digit. And the third and fourth digit are defined because it has to be the same. So there's 90 four digit palindromes. And now we subtract that from the total four digit numbers. So you have our four spots. And just like earlier, the three digit numbers. There are nine choices because it can be anything from one to nine. Ten choices because it can be anything from zero to nine. And the same thing for these two, it can be zero to nine, zero to nine, so ten choices. So again, since we're finding the number of four digit numbers that are not palindromes, this is just nine thousand. And if you subtract that off, we have nine thousand minus ninety, because there's nine thousand total four digit numbers and ninety palindromes. So nine thousand minus ninety is equal to eight, nine, one, ten. So this is our final answer. So our final answer is eight, nine, one, ten. Because there are nine thousand numbers and ninety palindromes. Okay, so for homework, you're gonna have a very similar problem for three digit numbers. So here's just the same, a similar idea as this problem. So a three digit palindrome basically is just A, B, A. So three digit palindromes have form A, B, A, where A and A are the same digit. So, okay, so is, so we can use, try using, for homework, try using the same idea as we use here. Instead, use it for three digit numbers. Okay, so long as, if you have any questions, any questions? So let's move on to this, this problem right here. This is our last problem for today. Okay, so there are nine different flavors of ice cream at ice cream shop. And Joe wants to buy two or three of scoops of their ice cream flavors. He doesn't like two of the flavors, mango and chocolate together. So he won't buy them together. How many ways can he buy ice cream? Okay, so we have nine different flavors of ice cream. So let's just call these flavors, um, we don't really know what they are. We just have nine flavors. So let's divide it into two cases. Two flavors or three flavors. So let's take tackle each of these cases separately. So if you have two flavors of ice cream, well, then how many ways are there to choose two of the nine flavors? This is just nine, choose two. But now we have to be very careful. A condition of the problem is that he doesn't like mango and chocolate together. He doesn't like these two flavors together. So if he doesn't like these two flavors together, we can't have these two flavors together, so we subtract one. So we have that 9 plus 2 is 36. And then we have the 36 minus 1 is 35. So essentially what we did is we used complementary counting because we found 9 plus 2 total flavors and subtracted the case where we had mango and chocolate. So there's 35 ways for this case. Now this is a harder case when we have three different flavors. So how, how many ways can we choose three flavors from? Now we choose three, of course. 
So now we need to track the ways we have mango and chocolate together. Let's say we have mango and chocolate. Now, after choosing mango and chocolate, we have seven flavors left. So these seven flavors, in order to, in order to form three different groups of ice cream, so we must subtract the number of ways where we have mango and chocolate together. And the number of ways where we have mango and chocolate together and another flavor, because we have to choose three flavors. So how many ways do we have mango and chocolate together and another flavor? Well, there are nine minus two equal to seven flavors here, because there's nine total flavors and mango and chocolate have to be there. So there are seven flavors. There are seven flavors that can go with the mango and chocolate. So basically, if you have any of the other seven flavors with mango and chocolate, it doesn't work. So you subtract seven. And we can evaluate this. Well, nine to three, nine to three, well, that's just going to be 84, which is basically, yeah, it's going to be 84. You can evaluate this by just using the formula and minus seven, 77. So we can add these up. You have 35. We have 35 ways of having two flavors, plus 77 ways of when you choose three flavors. And this is a total of 112 ways. So that's the final answer to this problem. Okay, so thanks everyone for coming to class. This is it, this is it for this class. Again, just like last time, there's six homework problems. There's six homework problems from, they include all, they all the concepts. So basically, you can have any of these, you can have any of these six, you can try these six problems also in this ambition form. And okay, so thank you for coming to class. Bye. Try to submit your answers. And also, you can review the video if you want. Thank you.